I'm a, I'm a professor here at Emory, so I'm used to having a lot more leverage over my audiences. So there will be a short quiz <laughs> immediately following my talk. Um, so uh, a couple of years ago, I was doing research on a book about how animation had impacted the live action film industry. And even though my book was mostly sort of historical and technical in its concerns, I, I kept running up against a, a really basic question related to my field. And um, there we go. What I was trying to figure out is what exactly is it that makes us respond to images the way that we do? I mean, what is it that makes one image of someone being hit in the head with a hammer funny? Whoops, I'm going the wrong direction. There we go. Another image of someone being hit in the head with a hammer frightening. And another image of someone being hit in the, hammer, in the head with a hammer Thor. Now, you guys probably think this is not a very interesting question. This is a no-brainer to you, right? Because you can draw all sorts of distinctions between how these different images work and how they've been contextualized and where you've seen them that make it very easy for you to sort of attune your response to the aesthetics of the image. We tend to think of images as really straightforward, right? Seeing is believing. It's self-evident. But it's a lot more complicated than that. For one thing, one of the things that we now know is that the way in which we respond to images is at least in part learned. Standards of beauty, for example, can vary widely across spans of time and across cultures. And children react very differently than do adults to images. How many of you had parents sadistic enough or stupid enough that they made you watch Bambi? <laughs> right? Try telling a kid who's just seen Bambi's mother get whacked in the forest that it's OK, it's just a cartoon. You will not save anything on the therapy bills. <laughs> Kids don't differentiate between cartoons and other kinds of images. That's why a child can look at a sausage with two dots for eyes and sticks for arms and say, that's grandma. <laughs> so on the one hand, images are something that we learn how to read. On the other hand, we see the world in a very different way than we look at images. This is great because we just talked about sound, and now we're going to focus almost exclusively on sight, and only partially because we can't get the sound to play through the machine. <laughs> so looking at pictures is very different from seeing the world. We are hardwired in our brains to respond to a wealth of visual information and visual cues. A human being that didn't know how to respond to the sight of a charging predator was an entree. So we developed a very sophisticated way of navigating space, navigating social situations, navigating our environment using our eyes. And for most of the history of picture making, this was fine. Because for most of the history of picture making, the pictures that we made of the world really didn't look very much like the world as it appeared to our eyes. Most sculptures, most paintings, most etchings, most drawings are in one way or another over most of human history highly stylized. So that if we look at the figures painted on the side of an Egyptian tomb, we only hope that real Egyptians didn't look like that. <laughs> now in the 1500s, things are going to change a little bit. And they're going to change in part because of technology. New innovations and new ways of seeing the world allowed artists, especially in Western Europe, to pursue something that we had never really seen in art before, which is the reproduction in an image of a world that looks the way it would look to our own eyes. This is a representation that also has resemblance. It looks like it exists in real space. And this becomes the gold standard for Western art right up through the end of the 1800s, the ability to paint a picture that looks as if we might have seen it in the real world. And then, in the 1800s, after we've spent centuries learning to paint what we see, along comes photography and ruins everything. <laughs> Unlike all the other ways that people have made pictures throughout history, photography is a mechanical rather than a biological process. Photographs are images made not by a person, but by a machine. That machine was perceived to be objective. In fact, when photography emerges in the 1800s, it emerges 
as a truth-telling medium. Our assumption is that the camera can only see what is really placed before it. So a photograph of a dead soldier means someone really died. A photograph of the scarred back of an escaped slave becomes proof, becomes a confirmation of the tragic human cost of the long atrocity of slavery. A painting can be art, but a photograph is a fact. And that makes photography uniquely and dangerously powerful. That's why we take mug shots. That's why we can admit into court uh, as evidence a photograph, but not a charcoal sketch. The photograph has authority. So in 1895, two French photographers, Auguste and Louis Lumiere, showed an audience in Paris what is believed to be the first, perform the first performances, anyway, of motion pictures for an audience. This little epic is called Train Arriving at a Station. <laughs> now we can chuckle at this now. But when this was shown in 1895, audiences in the front rows of the theater screamed and ducked out of the way. Now, we might be tempted to dismiss this story as apocryphal. But in fact, if we look at newspaper accounts of the display of these Lumiere films all over the world, and they were shown all over the world, there were performances in Hong Kong, in St. Petersburg, in Lisbon, in Philadelphia, we're going to see this repeated, where audiences ducked out of the way of the train. The thing is, that those audiences had no experience of motion pictures, but some experience with photography and a lot of experience with trains. They knew trains to be dangerous, lethal machines. And here's what happened. The sight of a real train, and it had to be a real train because photography is reality. The sight of a real train coming towards them leapt right over their awareness that they were sitting in a theater, right over their awareness that the screen was a two-dimensional construct. That sight of the train coming leapt past their consciousness and hit that animal part of their brain, and they reacted. That's kind of amazing. And that's the foundation of cinema's tremendous power. But this is a disruptive power, because if we react to all the images we see as if they are real, we are going to be in a world of trouble in most films. <coughs> Stories that we tell are full of things we would never want to have happen to us. They are full of drama, that is true, but they're also full of pain, death, alien invasions, Keanu Reeves, all kinds of bad things. <laughs> so what we're going to see is we're going to see cinema learning to create images that are real enough to be exciting and fun for us, but not so real that they can scar us for life. So. What does this mean for violence? If you think about the stories we tell, from, Bible, from the Bible through Shakespeare, through mythology, we tell extremely violent stories. If I am going to be empathically engaged with the characters on the screen and experience their pain as my pain, then James Bond stops being a hero and becomes a mass murderer. Think about it. We watch people die in movies all the time, and we like it. So going back to that original question of how do images uh, help us know how to react to them and how do we come to react to images the way that we do, we have to come up with a system whereby we know how to read the images. So what we're going to do is we're going to have some gun violence here in the house today. Now I want to warn you that some of the images we'll be seeing are not necessarily comfortable images, though they all come from movies that are popular and widely screened. This is a montage of people shooting each other in the movies. This is 1903, the Great Train Robbery. Here's 1931, Little Caesar, a gangster picture. And what we're going to notice here is that in the early days of cinema, shooting somebody and being shot was largely a pantomime affair. These are magic bullets. They go through things, but they don't go through people. When I've been shot, I kind of fall over, and I clutch some part of my body, and I register pain. 
right? I'm performing being shot, but I haven't seen any blood. This is a, a curiously sanitized way of dying. <laughs> Here's a Western, John Ford's Darling Clementine from 1946. And even though we've covered now three decades of cinema, it's about the same. We fall over, it's very dramatic. <laughs> and that's really the way violence is going to work in most motion pictures. The reason is that there are technological and also legal limitations on what I'm allowed to show and what you're allowed to see. I can't actually shoot people. Right? An image of somebody who's actually been shot is journalism. It's traumatizing. It's tragic. It has all that reality attached to it that gave photography its 19th century power. So by and large, acts of violence are going to be performed in a way that's very sort of sanitized. Then one day, all of that's going to change. Well, actually, not one day, one year. The year is 1967. Two films come out in 1967. One of them is directed by a guy named George Romero. It's called Night of the Living Dead. And I am not showing you a clip of it, because lunch. <laughs> the other is a film called Bonnie and Clyde. And it's a film that is going to change the way motion pictures are made, the way motion pictures are seen, and the way motion pictures are regulated in the United States. Basically, this is the parallel of Little Caesar. We have a group of lawmen who are ambushing a wanted criminal, in this case, Clyde Barrow. In both Little Caesar and Bonnie and Clyde, the police are going to use a machine gun. And let's just watch this for a minute. It's a totally different experience. For one thing, it drags out. It's excruciatingly long, right? We see not only impacts on objects, the bullet holes in the car, we see bullet holes in people. There is a lingering, a kind of relishing of this experience of, of death here. It was unlike anything that anybody had ever seen. A year later, well, two years later, in 1969, we're going to see the same thing that happened to the gangster film happen to the Western. This is The Wild Bunch by a guy named Sam Peckinpah. It's not unlike Darling Clementine. We've got a group of bad men and a group of lawmen. They're having uh, a gunfight. But now, instead of shooting past horses in a corral, we're shooting through a crowd of innocent bystanders marching through a, to a spiritual. And if you notice, the details of this image. Now, bullets go through people. We've developed tiny radio-controlled explosives that we strap to the bodies of actors. When we trigger the explosive, a little spurt of prop blood comes out the other side. And suddenly, instead of this bloodless pantomime that death has been in Hollywood films for decades, death becomes this splashy, spectacular affair. Much like the Lumiere's trains, much like the Lumiere's trains, the violence in Bonnie and Clyde and in the Wild Bunch leapt off the screen and affected audiences viscerally. Some people called the Wild Bunch a fascist work of art. It was given an X rating, not for sex, but for violence. And we get reports from exhibitors of members of the audience screaming, running out, fainting and throwing up. Something had happened that had restored to film the power to move our bodies in a way that bypassed consciousness. Violence at the end of the 1960s was shocking. But there's something really surprising about this. For years, reformers and pro-censorship groups, all the way back to the silent era, had expressed concern that violence in the movies, violence in media, would create violence in society that certain kinds of people, and it's always the same kinds of people, the kind of people who are easily led, the kind of people who aren't good at telling the, re, uh, the real from the unreal, and these are going to be children, the poor, the poorly educated, and women. The idea was that certain kinds of people 
would be inspired by the spectacles that they saw on the screen to imitate them in real life. But if we look through the lens of history at the spike in film violence in the late 1960s, what we realize is that violence in the movies was not the cause of violence in the broader society. It was the effect. The 1960s, which we remember now as the sort of the peace and love decade, the 1960s was a savage decade. We'd had the highly public assassination of public figures like John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Dr. Martin Luther King. Most of these assassinations, by the way, captured on film. We had the violence associated with the latter part of the civil rights movement. We had the war in Vietnam. This was a violent time. And what had happened was motion pictures had responded. Incidentally, most of this violence resonated particularly powerfully with teenagers teenagers and young adults who had become the dominant audience for motion pictures. Throughout the 1980s, movies get bloodier and stranger, gorier, more spectacular. New technologies like prosthetics that allow us to create sort of realistic appliances that attach to, to an actor's body and animatronics are going to make the spectacle of violence more and more a part of our cinema. Now this is mostly gonna be in two genres, the horror film and the science fiction film, both of which were deemed sort of in the 1940s to be kind of kid stuff or the stuff for B-movies and drive-ins. But by the end of the 1980s, science fiction is the most profitable genre in cinema and it remains the most profitable genre in cinema. And extreme horror films like the ones we are seeing some slides from, extreme horror films were so popular that at the high point of the boom in the 1980s, 60% of all movies made in America were horror films, especially splatter films. By the 1990s, we have more new toys. Let's look at where gun violence goes in the 1990s. Now we have computer-generated animation and the digital manipulation of images that's going to allow me to create objects that look real, but that behave in ways that real objects can't. Here's a sample of Western from 1995. Now we saw how at first bullets don't enter the body then we saw squibs being used to make it appear as if the body has been, been penetrated. But we're always going to be pushing the envelope. And now what we're going to do is use CGI to do this. The Matrix. What we're seeing is something that is impossible. We're seeing the tracks of bullets as they fly through space. The fascination and fetishization of the act of violence is a preoccupation of filmmaking and film technology. Now, I don't want to suggest necessarily um, that this is uh, a bad thing. But there is something in the way we make an image that makes one death look cool and another death look tragic, and another death look shocking. And if, in fact, there is a correlation between reality and photography, but that correlation is flipped. It's not that the movies are driving violence in our culture, but violence in our culture is finding a kind of funhouse mirror reflection in our movies. It creates an interesting opportunity for inquiry. What is it that we're looking to see when we sit down in the dark at these movies? Is it possible? that the ways in which these films don't necessarily give us an escape from violence as much as they give us a new way of using it. These are fantasies ultimately of control, a powerful way of constructing a world in which violence happens, but it happens on our own terms and according to our own aesthetic. And unlike the violence that we see captured by dashboard cameras and body cameras and jihadi videographers propagandizing decapitation, or the images that we see of violence in the streets or on beaches, 
the images that journalism and photography captures, these images are made for us, not to harm us, but to entertain us. It's an interesting opportunity to revisit the ways in which movies work and the ways in which we feel what we see. Thank you.